is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lockwell. Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Tom McKenzie in London and here's what's coming up on today's programme. European stocks and US futures, they're mixed as yesterday's Fed minutes signal a likely rate hike next month. That's despite forecasts for a recession. Chinese exports unexpectedly surge in March. It's the first increase in six months. In another sign, the, the economy is gaining strength. Plus, this week on Bloomberg UK, US President Biden is in Ireland after hailing 25 years since the Good Friday Agreement was signed in Belfast, Northern Ireland, ending, of course, decades of armed conflict. Let's check in on these markets before, before we focus in on all things UK. The UK GDP print coming in, by the way, for the month of February, slightly soggier than had been expected, pointing to maybe stagnation in the UK. Still slightly better picture than the BOE had forecast. Across the European markets, you're getting a lift, certainly from LVMH, and we'll unpack that story for you in the next couple of minutes. Across the benchmark, gains of four-tenths of a percent. Again, that CPI print, pick your poison, really. Are you expecting and are you taking relief from that expected pause come in May? That is what traders are now betting on. Others, though, starting to think about whether or not you get cut, cuts towards the end of this year. On the concern front, it's that stickiness around core. And does that make you put you in a position where you're expecting rates that are going to remain higher for an extended period of time? That debate, of course, remains live. Across the futures, you're looking at gains of two-tenths of a percent. The two-year at 3.95, so still below that 4% at the front end of the U.S. curve. We were talking about the oil story just in the last hour and the geopolitics between Saudi Arabia, Russia and the U.S. Currently you're looking at Brent at $87 a barrel. Not a lot of movement in the session, of course, after the gains that we've seen after that surprise Cut. Let's have a look at how things are playing out then regionally across the map. The standout really is France and the Cat Cajon, again, as a result of what is happening in the consumer space with LVMH. When the map comes through, you'll see that reflected. The UK, of course, as well, taking into effect in terms of basic resources. You've seen a bit of pressure in terms of iron ore around some concerns about demand coming through from China. The broader picture from China, of course, in terms of the data is that exports did come in much stronger than expected. Two lines coming through then, two threads coming through from China. One is the export strength and one is that demand from consumers around the luxury space. There's France popping again on the back of that demand coming through for LVMH. And talking of LVMH, it is the biggest gainer on the stock 600 this morning. That's a sales soared as Chinese shoppers bounced back from the world's strictest lockdowns and splashed out on luxury items. There's the gain then, 4.7%, 4.7% for LVMH, on track, as Caroline Conan was telling us, to be a $500 billion company. And the gains there, of course, lifting the broader luxury sector as well on expectations that that demand impulse coming through from the Chinese consumer is going to support the broader luxury index. Let's get back to the inflation question then, and unpick the CPI that came out yesterday. There was something in it for the Hawks, something there for the Dubs as well. Data from US showing that core CPI eased slightly in March. And speaking after the reading, San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly said inflation still has a way to come down. However, and this is crucial, she added more hikes may not be needed. Looking ahead, there are good reasons to think that policy may have to tighten more to bring inflation down. But there are also good reasons to think that the economy may continue to slow, even without additional policy adjustments. OK, let's bring in our markets reporter, Valerie Taital. Valerie, we saw moves in the equity markets, moves in the bond markets initially on this print. And then, of course, you get to the point where you have to unpack the guts of the data. Talk us through, walk us through that market reaction. Yes, yeah, so the knee-jerk reaction was that it was a weaker number. Equities rallied, Treasuries rallied, the two-year yield rallied at 15 basis points at one time, and the dollar softened. A lot of that was reversed when we did unpack the data, and I think there was a realization that, yes, it was a weaker number, but it alone does not justify a Fed pause in May. It could perhaps be easier for them to justify a pause later in the cycle, or perhaps cuts if the economy were to weaken, but uh, the, in terms of specific data, 
that the Fed can use in its upcoming May meeting, it's probably not the one they're going to lean on. And that's the question the markets really have right now and Fed members themselves. You know, we've heard from Goolsby and Daly, as we just mentioned there. Uh, there are clearly some in the camp for a pause in the next meeting, but what data can they specifically use to lean on it? And the market doesn't see an easy way for them to communicate that. Hence, we're still pricing in uh, uh, the probability of a hike in the May meeting and a pause as soon as, as, soon as June. Okay, Value Titel from our markets team, of course, assessing that reaction to the CPI print. Let's get more analysis now and bring in Cameron Chedid, Chief Investment Strategist at iShares EMEA. Cameron, thank you for joining us, of course, from BlackRock. Oh, we appreciate your insights. Let, let's start there then. Does this CPI print, do the minutes give us any more clarity on, first of all, the inflation picture in the US and the Fed response? I mean, building on the CPI comments that Valerie just made, I think if you dig in deeper into the number, there are plenty of indicators for the hawks. Uh, goods inflation, which had had been uh, uh, decelerating for a few months, has started to show some reacceleration. And then when you look at services inflation at the core, which is ultimately what's going to matter most because it's tied to the tightness in the labor market and the wage pressure there, that is still showing some pressure, even if uh, wages are starting to, uh, or jobs have maybe passed the, passed the peak. So a bit more pressure there. And from the minutes, we do get uh, some signs that uh, Fed members are looking at some of the tightening that's coming from uh, things other than rate hikes, such as uh, the tightening in lending from the bank sector but is it enough for a pause in May I don't think so okay so you think they go what 25 basis points in May yeah I mean the markets are still pricing what a 70 percent yeah. chance of that and and we think that's still on the table and they pause and hold and here's the question then in terms of the back end of the year and we were speaking to Skyler Montgomery from Skyler Montgomery Coney from from TS Lombard earlier and it's her and the team's view there at TS Lombard that you get down to 275 2.75 percent on Fed rates by the end of this year because of recession risks, the depth of that recession, the aggressiveness of that recession, and the necessary Fed response. What is the flaw in that argument? I mean, the market pricing of uh, Fed cuts between now and year-end has gotten a lot less dovish than it was mm. uh, before, but we're still looking at about two two cuts there about uh, uh, price then. We lean against that. Yeah. I mean, when you think about the uh, Fed hold, uh, we think they will hold and, and stay there. Um, and ultimately, their pressures in inflation at levels like 5%, pressures in core, don't justify such a quick pivot to cuts. This is a new playbook we're talking about, a playbook where central banks will not immediately jump at the first sign of cracks in the economy. So do you buy the pause or do you have to wait till those cuts come through as you forecast, you and the team at BlackRock, in the early part of next year? Yeah, so we, we look at the pause as something that will stay through to 2024. We're not looking at cuts before maybe as late as mid-24 uh, mm. or late. Okay, and so what is the catalyst to get more exposure to equities, and particularly developed market equities? What yeah. are you looking for to give you that momentum? Yeah, I mean, uh, right now, there's, we're still cautious on DM equities. Uh, earnings are starting uh, later this week. I do think that there's an element of is the pain in earnings going to be as quick as we had been expecting or could it be a little bit delayed uh, given that expectations have already come down um, and and so the question is uh, do equities do a little bit better than expected in Q2 and then see the pain in H2 or do they see the pain uh, sooner so it's not so much looking for catalysts to buy but rather looking for catalysts to turn more cautious how important are these bank earnings that come through Friday to give us a clearer picture of how this economy is holding up so the numbers themselves are probably going to be a little bit dated what will be matter more is the guidance uh, from corporate uh, announcements guidance around uh, lending standards uh, lending conditions expectations of uh, profits those will matter more what took us through the constructive view that you have on global health care because there's some who push back in terms of the valuations there's been mm. a tick up there's been a preference for health care amongst many investor you mm. say there's still an opportunity to get exposure to global health care what mm -hmm. is the view there so when looking at the sector complex, uh, one thing that is clear, and here talking about ETF flows mm. for a second, if I digest the flows that we've seen in March, there was a big long duration theme. And uh, as a result of that, tech sector flows picked up significantly. In addition to the record that we saw in rates ETFs in, in March, another long duration theme, but, but tech sector flows picked up significantly whilst healthcare uh, fell in terms of uh, flows. Yet we're still positive on healthcare. Why? Um, we think that, you know, whilst near term, there has been some pressures on the rate 
um, on the rates uh, moves. I, I think healthcare ultimately there's there's a, a structurally higher demand, especially for elective parts of of healthcare that has come back online post COVID and is not going away anytime soon. And that's a source of of reliable profit for for healthcare sector you, going forward. And, and you like you like technology as well. How do you square that view on technology with the view? that rates will be higher for longer. How do yeah. those two coexist? So we don't like all technology. We are picky with our exposures, looking at quality tech. So really thinking about sub uh, parts of the tech sector that can withstand earning pressure. And this is also a theme that we consider across all equity investing. How do you stick with the exposures that have high ROE and high free cash flow yield to navigate the earning pressure that we expect and to navigate the higher rates for longer? Okay. Always excellent. Karim Hachedi, thank you very much for coming into the studio with the views, of course, unpacking the implications of uh, the CPI print and what it means for central banking and how to position within this environment. Investment strategist at iShares, Amir, of course, at BlackRock. Thank you. Coming up, Chinese exports unexpectedly jump in March. We're going to unpack that data from the world's second largest economy. And really, the question is whether or not it can be sustained. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. Let's get the Bloomberg First Word News now with Leanne Gerrans. Leanne. Tom, good morning. A U.S. federal appeals court has upheld continued limited access to the abortion pill. The ruling partly granted by the Biden administration's request to put on hold the Texas court ruling with overturned FDA approval of the pill. But the court did allow restrictions that were lifted since 2016 to be reinstated. That will mean access to the abortion pill will be limited to the seventh week of pregnancy. That's a cut from 10 weeks. LVMH sales have soared as Chinese shoppers bounced back from the world's strictest lockdowns and splashed out on luxury items. Organic sales at the group's biggest unit, which sells fashion and leather goods, rose 18% in the first quarter. Paris-based LVMH, Europe's most valuable company, is the first luxury goods maker to publish quarterly results and is generally considered a bellwether for the rest of the industry. Now, Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney has has proposed Flavio Cantino as the new CEO of the country's biggest utility, NL, resolving a spat with her governing coalition. Veteran executive Paolo Scaroni has been proposed as chairman. Scaroni has served as chairman of football club AC Milan and is a former close ally of the former Premier Silvia Berlusconi. Claudio Descalzi has been confirmed as the pick to continue running the oil giant. Any. Bloomberg has learned that Apple assembled more than $7 billion of iPhones in India's last fiscal year, tripling production as it moves away from China. That means almost 7% of iPhones now come from India, the world's fastest growing smartphone arena significantly up from about 1% in 2021. Brazilian President Lula da Silva is visiting China, where his talks with President Xi Jinping are expected to focus on trade as well as Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The trip comes as Xi embarks on a round of diplomacy after visiting Moscow recently, where he strengthened ties with Putin while touting Beijing's call for a ceasefire in Ukraine. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans and this is Bloomberg Tom. Leanne Gerrans here in London. Thank you. Coming up, we look at how a fracturing US-Saudi oil pact could play into Vladimir Putin's hands. We dive in to today's Big Take. That is next. This is Bloomberg. market was pricing in before the report 3% on Fed funds by the end of next year. You know, if inflation is decelerating, if the economy is heading into a slowdown, 
I think 3% is highly optimistic. We're moving through this period into a, a, a new period of, you know, I think a, a, a pause and a reflection from the Fed, you know, whether they hike in, in, in May or not. If we have, you know, a soft landing in the economy, I could see the inflation rate here getting stuck at three to three and a half percent. What does the Fed do at that point? If anything else goes wrong, if there's any negative sign whatsoever on the economy between now and the May 3rd report, or the May 3rd meeting, I think the Fed's done. OK, Bloomberg Television guests there responding to the latest US CPI print. Of course, feeding into inflation, at least on the headline, is oil. What it means for gasoline prices, of course, following that uh, surprise OPEC Plus uh, cut that we saw uh, towards the end of last week. You're currently, of course, seeing a picture, when it comes to Brent, of the downside, down two tenths of percent, $87 a barrel. The context over the month, though, Brent is up a little over 18 and staying with the oil story, just three years ago, when OPEC Plus members fell out, the US found itself playing the role of peacemaker between the oil producers. Now, the US looks more like their target. The Saudi-Russian oil alliance has the potential to cause all kinds of trouble for the American economy and even for President Biden's re-election campaign. And this month's OPEC Plus decision to cut crude output may be just the start. That is the analysis in today's important Bloomberg Big Take. Here with us with the details is Bloomberg Economics' Ziad Daoud. Ziad, most analysts expect then oil prices to remain above $80 a barrel. They're $87 on Brent right now. Does that hold up? What are we expecting in terms of the next set of decisions coming through from OPEC Plus? Well, I think what analysts are expecting is oil prices above $80 per barrel over the coming years. And I think there are three factors that's driving this uh, forecast. The first factor is um, economics. So if you look at the funding needs of OPEC Plus members, they need oil prices that are high, uh, above $80 per barrel. Um, so that's one factor. The second factor is geopolitics. Um, so the oil for security pact between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia, which underpinned the oil market over the last few decades is fracturing and that could lead to higher oil prices. And the third factor is the competition to OPEC Plus. A few years ago, Shell provided significant competition to OPEC Plus, which limited the upside for oil. This threat is receding and Shell is no longer the threat that it used to be for OPEC Plus. You add all of these factors mm. up and that's why analysts are expecting oil above 80 in the coming years. On the geopolitics then, Ziad, what happened to that relationship between Riyadh and Washington? Is this a blip in terms of the relationship or is this a more fundamental, more structural change? Well, geopolitical alliances move in slow motion. We've had this uh, big alliance between Saudi and the US where Saudi provided energy security to the US and the rest of the global economy and the US provided security to the kingdom. But we've seen signs in the last few years that this relationship is fracturing. Just one example, uh, since uh, President Joe Biden visited Saudi Arabia last July, OPEC Plus actually did two uh, production cuts when Biden went there to, to ask for higher supply. That is one example. When Saudi Arabia wanted to ease tensions with uh, neighboring Iran, China brokered the deal, not the U.S., and the deal was signed in, Be signed in Beijing. Saudi Arabia recently joined the Shanghai uh, Cooperation Organization, uh, an, an alliance that's led by China and has Russia and Iran among its members. So you look at all these small incidents and they tell you that that relationship between Saudi and the U.S., which underpinned the energy markets for decades, is fracturing and it's wobbling and it will have impact on oil prices going forward. OK, hugely significant for the global economy and geopolitics more broadly. Bloomberg economics Ziad Daoud, thank you very much indeed. You can read the big take anytime on your Bloomberg terminal and on Bloomberg.com. Now, China's exports unexpectedly rose in March. That's as demand from most Asian countries and Europe improved. The jump in exports was also driven by more factories in China opening following the lifting of zero COVID restrictions in a further positive sign for the economy. Let's bring in James Mager then, Bloomberg's economics editor for Greater China on the ground for us in Beijing. James, what are the main drivers then of what has been described as a pretty surprising result? So I think the first driver you're seeing is a lot of factories are still shut and obviously in January, uh, partly because of the everyone catching COVID in December and into January, and then obviously the Lunar New Year holidays. And that, that bled into February this year. And so there seems to have been a, a sort of a, a 
a lot of a lot of output that was sort of delayed into March, which should have gone out of the factories in January and February, but didn't. And so you're seeing that jump in, in out and you know goods going on the ships in March. And the second thing looks to be that you know demand has remained strong from places that are not America. So especially ASEAN, the ten nations that are directly south of China, exports there jumped thirty something percent. You saw rises in exports to Europe, uh, three point something percent. Africa, South America, a lot of other places which we, you know when we uh, there's been you know obviously we talk about China U.S. trade a lot and also China European trade, but there are lots of other places in the world that also there's large demand for goods from China. And so those places are really what drove that. Uh, drove that big demand spike that we saw in, in the numbers in, in March. Okay, James Mega in Beijing upping, unpacking, I should say, uh, that surprise jump in Chinese exports. Thank you. Now, coming up, Chancellor, UK Chancellor Jeremy Hunt pushing back against the IMF's gloomy outlook for the UK economy. Bloomberg UK is next. Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg UK. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. This week we focus on the Good Friday Agreement, US President Biden in Ireland and the economic headwinds from Brexit. But first, let's talk economics. Data out this morning showing the British economy stagnated in February as strike action crippled public services. Despite the disappointing reading, January's GDP print was revised up to 0.4% growth, reducing the risk of recession this year. Meanwhile, the IMF has again warned that the UK is set to be the worst performing economy in the G7. The Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, sat down with Bloomberg for an interview at the IMF spring meetings in Washington. Well, we will do better than that. They are um, wrong, the projections. Our, our, our forecasts are significantly better than the IMF forecast. But what I should say is that last year we were the fastest growing economy in the G7. But why is there this gap then? Well, I think, Where is it um, coming from? you know, it's not just me. I mean, the German finance mm -hmm. minister uh, says he's much more optimistic about Germany's prospects. Uh, I think Janet Yellen has said the same about the United States. So, so you say we will prove um, so we are wrong with this. we are very confident about the UK's medium and longer term prospects but we don't pretend that we're going we're not going through a difficult period like everyone we're dealing with very high inflation which we have to bring down that means interest rates are higher but you look at an economy and you say what are the sectors that are going to make the biggest difference that are going to shape the 21st century and it's technology it's life sciences it's uh, entertainment industries. Those are the industries where Europe has the biggest, where the UK has the biggest sector in Europe. And that gives us great hope for the future. And, and if you say we will grow more than expected and we are going to beat uh, those projections, obviously you list a number of areas where you feel you can do better than expected. But you also have a potential, well, trade deal with the EU. There had been tensions with the EU, potential tariffs uh, that could come into play. That we believe it's not going to happen now with the uh, Windsor framework. Uh, but I do wonder, uh, when is this going to be fully clarified for investors? Because still, it's not been fully sealed. Well, the Windsor framework has been agreed. And I think this is... But in Northern Ireland, you don't have still a confirmation this is going through. And, and uh, they have to agree to this. We are committed to the Windsor framework. It will go through. What we don't have in Northern Ireland, which we are trying very hard, and indeed the president is also trying very hard to get back, is power sharing by the political parties in Northern Ireland. But in terms of the trade uh, relationship with the EU, the trading that's going to happen between uh, the rest of the UK and Northern Ireland, that is settled with the Windsor framework. And that removes a major irritant in our relations with the EU. UK Chancellor Jeremy Hunt speaking to Maria Tadeo in Washington, D.C. Now from Washington to Dublin. President Biden is in Ireland today after visiting Belfast, 25 years after politicians signed the landmark Good Friday Agreement. It changed the course of Northern Ireland's history, seeking to end more than 30 years of armed conflict known as the Troubles. Biden said top American companies are now ready to invest in the country. That's if its peace process endures and the power sharing government is restored. There are scores of major American corporations wanting to come here, wanting to invest, 
Many have already made homes in Northern Ireland, employing over 30,000 people. And in just the past decade, American business has generated almost $2 billion in investment in the region. Now, Bloomberg's Louise Moon explains the legacy of the Good Friday Agreement. 25 years ago, politicians in Belfast signed the Good Friday Agreement, officially ending more than 30 years of conflict in Northern Ireland. Known as the Troubles, around 3,500 people were killed in violence including bombings and rioting. The prospect of peace and a stable devolved government was met with overwhelming support. Tony Blair, Bertie Ahern and Bill Clinton played a key role in helping hammer out the agreement. It was based on power sharing between mostly Catholic nationalists who favoured independence and Protestant unionists wanting to preserve ties with the UK. But the journey hasn't always been smooth and distrust remains along with continued instances of violence. We are dealing with a divided society. We wish it wasn't, but it is. And, you know, you're go it's going to need tender and open care for, for a long time. The Northern Ireland Assembly at Stormont has been unable to function for 40% of its lifespan due to disagreements between the sides. Most recently, the Executive Committee hasn't met since February 2022, discourse spurred in part by post-Brexit trading arrangements. While not suspended, no major decisions can be made. But, despite many continuing challenges, optimism remains. Whatever the problems in Northern Ireland, what people should never forget, it's a world better from where it was. And if we exercise common sense and realism today, we can keep the peace intact. That was Bloomberg's Louise Moon on the Good Friday Agreement, which will be the focus, of course, of and remains the focus of this UK show. Now, let's bring in Bloomberg's Dublin Bureau Chief, Moena Koniem, who has been following President Biden's trip to the region. Moena, what is the significance then of this Ireland trip for the president, for the island of Ireland and for Northern Ireland? Morning, yes. So it is a very significant time, particularly as we were just discussing. It's the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement which largely brought an end to violence um, that had been going on for 30 years in Northern Ireland. Um, that's very important for the Republic of Ireland as well, obviously sharing a border with the North. It was one of the main signatories of the agreement and is still there's a North-South Joint Council, um, which is very important for governing general operations, that there's trade discussions, there's security discussions, and it's you know, Biden will be discussing all of those issues, I'm sure, when he meets with um, the Prime Minister, Leo Varadkar, today. It's also significant, of course, because Biden is very proud of his Irish heritage. Um, he yesterday visited a couple of counties where he has ancestors from, um, County Louth, and he went to Dundalk. And tomorrow he'll be going up to County Mayo, um, where he's expected to give a speech um, in the evening. So there's been a huge amount of jubilation, and he's called this, you know, a homecoming. He said yesterday that it feels like coming home. And he is the most Irish president um, by heritage since JFK. So this is a sort of special moment, I think, for him personally, as well as for Ireland as a country. Yeah, well, they all claim that heritage, don't they? Uh, and for understandable reasons. There's a political dividend uh, back, back in the US from that. What, in terms of the power sharing, there is no power sharing. Is there any chance that the president's presence can move the dial, get the DUP back in? Well, of course, you know, it was hoped by some, I think, slightly optimistically, perhaps, that it would make a significant difference. It has, of Definitely his message yesterday was very optimistic and very positive about the future of Northern Ireland, a promise of investment, uh, which is something that has suffered as a result of the current political impasse. So really, it was positive, but ultimately the issues that the unionists have with the trading arrangements for Northern Ireland as a result of Brexit and the ideological issues with treating Northern Ireland differently to the rest of the UK um, and including it, say, in the EU single market, 
those are much deeper seated issues that somebody from outside unfortunately ha you know can only say so much um, so it's nice to have the promise and uh, DUP leader Jeffrey Donaldson was quite positive in his comments yesterday evening um, about the way in which the president had um, conducted his speech and you know appreciated the message but the other DUP members I mean they're not you know there doesn't seem to be any sign of them changing their position there doesn't seem to be much hope of power sharing returning any time soon particularly given there's local elections coming up in May which of course they'll want to make sure that they uh, judge the support of their base um, before you know making any decisions at this point okay Bloomberg's Dublin bureau chief Moena Konya thank you very much indeed now coming up a view from Belfast where they could discuss the significance of Joe Biden's trip to Northern Ireland. Get more context and analysis. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Unfortunately, since the Good Friday Agreement over the 25 years, because there still has been political in instability and the institutions of governance in Northern Ireland have only sat fitfully, um, I think the great promise of the economic dividend has not yet been achieved. But I do believe there is, uh, looking forward now, as we come to the final sort of um, element of uh, the, the post-Brexit arrangements for trade, that economic dividend is there for the taking. I mean, Northern Ireland could be in a unique position of having access to the single market uh, and to the, the, the Great Britain market, the UK market um, of 65 million. So that's a unique position for any uh, piece of the territory. So I think now it's time as we reach this final part, hopefully, of getting the institutions back up and running with the DUP um, that uh, people grasp that opportunity and have and we, that we get back to that strategic leadership that we had 25 years ago uh, and that people move on from fixed positions and embrace that opportunity of, of great prosperity and peace going forward. That was former Irish Government Minister Liz O'Donnell, one of the negotiators of the Good Friday Agreement. Let's get more context then and bring in Professor at Queen's University, Belfast, Katie Hayward, joining us from that city and the city of Belfast. Katie, thank you very much for your time. Let's get your take then on the presidential visit to Northern Ireland, to Ireland. Is there more than symbolism to this visit? Yes, absolutely. I think President Biden's speech was a very important moment, not least because he was accompanied by the Special Economic Envoy, Joe Kennedy III, and they were really trying to emphasise the possibilities for Northern Ireland now looking forward. It was notable that he talked about the need for hard work and hope at a time when things do seem quite fragile, um, and also think, talking about economic opportunities such as might be available to Northern Ireland. And it's a really powerful message for the President of the United States to say that our futures are together, that America remains firmly committed to Northern Ireland, to the island of Ireland and the peace here, and that message of linking peace and prosperity in, in real terms, uh, about mm. talking about investments and commitments, I think that was really significant and it goes beyond symbolism. So an important message from, from the president, but it doesn't seem, at least at this stage, that he's managed to convince the DUP to return to the table, to return to government and power sharing in Stormont. What is needed to get to that point? How far are the DUP away from being convinced? I don't think it was ever likely that the president was um, going to be in a position to encourage or persuade or pressurize the DUP to go back in. I think the situation for um, um, for them is, is rather complicated. Um, they remain um, very much outside of the um, power sharing institutions with the support of their um, base. And this is because they are concerned around Northern Ireland's future, its position in the United Kingdom. And this isn't something that um, somebody like the president could um, reassure them on. I think we are going to see a, a long, slow process um, of restoring confidence and, and commitment to the um, power sharing institutions from across um, the wider unionist community. 
Um, I think, though, it was notable that the president did say, I'm not going to be to, you know, it's not my place to tell you this, but it's, it is, for me, important that um, democratic institutions function. And it was uh, clear that he was saying um, you need to have those democratic institutions functioning um, as, a, as a determination that this is the best situation for, for Northern Ireland. And the DUP mm. does have a difficult decision to make. Um, and we, we will see, I think, in the coming months, um, if the situation stabilises in that UK EU relationship, perhaps that will help them move forward back into power sharing following um, all party talks, I would imagine. So, so, Professor, is there more that the UK, is there more that the EU and Brussels can do to convince the DUP and address some of those concerns? I mean, we know that the UK, particularly the European Union, has said there's, there's, there's not much more they're going to do. So the Windsor framework that revises the protocol on Ireland, Northern Ireland, does go considerably far towards adjusting the protocol in response to the practical issues um, around the protocol. Uh, that were being raised particularly by businesses in Northern Ireland and Britain. Um, in terms of the political dimensions, though, um, the questions around Northern Ireland's place in the Union, that is something that we would expect the DUP to be asking more from, um, from the UK government. This is going to be a challenge, of course, because the UK government may wish to reassure unionists, but at the same time, um, an important element of the Good Friday Belfast Agreement is that the government who is exercising sovereign power in Northern Ireland does so with rigorous impartiality. So there is a limit as to mm. how much the UK government can be seen to be trying to meet the needs of strong unionists. We should bear in mind, um, polling shows that those who are softer unionists, the sort of the more moderate unionists, particularly the Ulster Unionist Party, um, are supportive of the Windsor framework and do welcome it. So it's, it's much more the hardline strong unionists who still remain opposed um, rather than the spread of unionism altogether. And, and, and on support for that framework, for the Windsor framework, what does the Queen's University polling tell us about how much support there is across Northern Ireland? So we see now, we've been doing regular polls every four months um, in Queen's on the protocol. And so we can see change over time. And we definitely see that the Windsor framework has made a difference. So there is majority support now for these arrangements. And it's a bit more of a solid basis than it was prior to the Windsor framework. We also see a, a clear majority of people, around um, almost seven out of ten, saying that there are potential economic benefits to come to Northern Ireland from uh, the Windsor framework. Most notably, we see support across the board, including from strong unionists, saying that they want to see direct engagement with Northern Ireland stakeholders on this. And I think this relates to a wider question of having one's voice heard. Northern Ireland is in a really unique position. Um, and I think the fact that we haven't had the functioning democratic institutions for four out of the last six years does mean that people feel that their their concerns and interests aren't being properly represented, particularly when we come to these really big decisions that are affecting Northern Ireland's future um, in that UK-EU relationship. OK, Professor Katie Haywood, really appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us with really deep insights on the politics of Northern Ireland coming from Queen's University and the city of Belfast. We appreciate it. Coming up, could the UK become stagflation nation? GDP flatlines in February. We're going to dig into the numbers and ask what it means for the Bank of England's next rate decision. The analysis next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg UK. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. Now, UK GDP data out this morning showed the economy stagnating in February. According to Bloomberg Economics, the weak reading means there is still a risk the UK could enter a technical recession in the first half of this year. However, because that given uh, much of the weakness, because of much of the weakness, uh, a lot of that can be attributed to strike action, it's unlikely to last. And of course, we heard from the Chancellor in Washington pushing back on the idea that the UK is going to end up uh, in recession, or at least in as bad a place as the IMF predicts. Let's bring in Jamie Rush now, Chief Europe Economist for Bloomberg Economics. Jamie, give us the context around uh, the GDP print then. Are we now stagflation nation? What are the months ahead looking like? 
Well, yeah, as we heard, the, the, there was some strike action which, which kind of pushed down on activity in February. Uh, you'll get some of that activity back later on in the quarter. Um, picture, the big picture is like first quarter, GDP is going to be flattish. Second quarter, probably a contraction because I don't know what you'll be doing on May the 8th, but I'm going to be in my garden barbecuing and everyone's going to be on bank holiday. So I hope that's to be gonna... invited to that, Jay. Of course, I'm of course, Tom. Yeah. Um, so, um, so that's going to, I mean, you so know. So that's, that's the coronation. Gonna, yeah, weekend. exactly. Coronation weekend, there's going to be, you know, there's going to be a lull in activity as a result of that. So that, that, that's kind of, there's a couple of things pushing down. It's going to mean that underlying growth is actually a bit stronger than that. Um, but, you know, the, the economy is, is going to be going slow for the rest of the year. And, and why? It's because monetary policy is going to be squeezing it. So does that give the opportunity, the BOE, the opportunity to, to stamp out, to hold off? The economy is slowing. You're seeing there's some lines crossing about 30 minutes ago in terms of the number of defaults. Loan defaults are ticking up. The access to mortgages are becoming more difficult. They can stand pat, can't they? It would be an argument. So, so I, I, markets would expect them to hike. But I, I think that over the, over the coming weeks, uh, we will see a, a bit more evidence on, on, the, on slowing pay gains in the, in the labour market. Uh, we'll see, we are seeing tightening of financial conditions. That's going to weigh on the economy beyond what the Bank of England does. So I think there, you know, there, there is, there is a, strong, a strong case that the Bank of England should just stay on hold now, and, and that's, that's, that's what we're forecasting. OK, we've been talking, of course, and focused a lot on what's happening in Northern Ireland, given the President's visit to Northern Ireland now, uh, the island of Ireland, or Dublin, I should say. And in terms of the potential dividend, the economic dividend for Northern Ireland from Brexit, and there's still a lot of ifs and buts in terms of power sharing and Stormont and the Assembly, and, of course, the Windsor framework. But what is your assessment of the potential upside for that part of the UK economy? Well, I mean, first, like Northern Ireland's 2% of, of UK GDP, so it's a very small part of the overall picture. So it's not going to, the Windsor framework doesn't change the, the overall aggregates for the UK. Mm. For Northern Ireland, I mean, of course, it's going to be better than the arrangement that was there to, to begin with. I'd expect a modest boost. Um, but you know, the, the Northern Ireland has long-standing economic problems which need to be addressed, and they are bigger than the than than, than Brexit. They are they are weak productivity. Okay, so weak productivity is still something that's going to be solved. And the U.S. president talked about the potential for billions of dollars of U.S. investment coming through. It, is is he is he just talking shop there, or is that is that real? To what extent could that foreign investment be be a catalyst for that part of the U.K. as well? Well, I, you know, we heard from your guest earlier that about the the political instability that sort of been been in place in Northern Ireland for, for so long. Yeah. Um, I mean, having a functioning government, of course, is an important part, and that's one of the big things that will drive investment decisions. We've seen that with Brexit in the in you know in the wider UK. Mm. You need the political stability for direct foreign direct investment to happen. So I, I think that moving beyond the the current deadlock in Parliament would be would be an important step. Okay, Jamie Rush. Always appreciate it. Thank you for the analysis. Chief Europe Economist for Bloomberg Economics on the potential economic implications for Northern Ireland and, of course, assessing that latest GDP print for the broader UK. Be sure to subscribe to Bloomberg's In the City podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. New episodes drop every Thursday. You're looking across the UK markets now, range-bound, the FTSE 100 at 7,821. The futures in the US still pointed to gains of a little over a tenth of a percent. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour with Matt Miller in New York and Anna Edwards here in London. This is Bloomberg. We're moving through this period into a, a, a new period of, you know, I think a, a, a pause and a reflection from the Fed, you know, whether they hike in, in, in May or not. If we have, you know, a soft landing in the economy, I could see the inflation rate here getting stuck at three to three and a half percent. What does the Fed do at that point? If anything else goes wrong, if there's any negative sign whatsoever on the economy between now and the May 3rd report, or their May 3rd meeting, I think the Fed's done. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards and Matt Miller. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. The Fed appears on track toward another interest rate hike next month. Policymakers are shrugging off their own staff's warning of a recession. A sign that global growth may be better than expected. Exports from China unexpectedly rose last month. And the British economy took a bigger hit than expected, 
from public sector strikes last month. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. Well, we got through the data, we got through the Fed minutes, we look ahead to earnings season then, Matt. Kicks off, uh, well, here in Europe, we've already had some, kicking off uh, with the banks tomorrow in the US. It, we're, we're looking forward to it. I'm still not over the minutes, right? We have the Fed, um, at least the staff, projecting a recession, and that's in print now. That can't be taken back. So from now on, when Jay Powell gets questions about that, he can't say it's not in our forecast because it is. Nonetheless, we have futures rising this morning. S&P futures up only one tenth of one percent um, on, I guess, a little bit of optimism that the Fed has really reached the top. You heard um, from David Kelly just now. You heard from markets. They're really skeptical of the Fed's um, implication that's not going to cut rates in 2023. I think the Fed doubts the market, or the market doubts the Fed credibility in that sense. So as he said, as David Kelly said, if anything goes wrong in the economy, the market expects the Fed to come in um, and, and, and save it. The Fed put, maybe not dead. The U.S. 10-year yield right now moving higher, but still at 342 right where we saw it yesterday. Not a heck of a lot of movement there, but you do see the Bloomberg U.S. dollar index coming down to an ever weaker level, right? Right now at 1220, it's losing ground. The dollar is against most major currencies, against the uh, pound and the euro, of course. It's also losing ground against gold, which is now up to uh, 2020, 2030 and continues to rise, losing ground against Bitcoin, which is over $30,000 and continues to rise. So dollar weakness really playing through in this market. And then NYMEX crude, right now it's down a penny to 83.25 a barrel, but NYMEX and Brent both put in some big gains, some two, 3% gains yesterday, and they're really starting to climb again after hovering around, well, 80 and 85 for the last week and a half. So definitely watch this space. Let's take a look at what's going on in Asia. There's one big mover to point out, but you do see the MSCI Asia Pacific, the broader index up about one tenth of one percent. Not a heck of a lot of movement there. The Hang Seng up two tenths of one percent after some um, positive economic news out of China. We're going to talk about that. A lot of macro news maybe to shape the markets um, this morning. Alibaba is the stock that I wanted to talk about right now down 2% as SoftBank moves to cut its stake in um, the Chinese mega cap. So putting a little bit of hit on China tech there. And then I just wanted to highlight the dollar. Actually a little bit stronger against the yen right now. Just a little bit, but you can buy more than 133 yen for a dollar and uh, you know, a half hour ago, that was down at 132 and change. So maybe that's starting to turn around a little bit. Anna, what do you see in Europe? We're not seeing much of a turnaround in the Northern European equity market performance here, Matt. Pretty flat, actually, on the German market, on the UK market as well. Uh, what we have in Paris and in Milan is luxury goods going higher and energy stocks going lower. That seems to be the way we're trading today. The CAC Caron really standing out as an outperformer today, up by nine-tenths of one percent. And that represents the biggest stock story that we're covering here in Europe, and that is around LVMH. So the consumer products and services, that includes the luxury sector, is higher by 2.6 percent. Real outperformance from the Paris market then geographically and sectorially from uh, this particular luxury goods sector. It is LVMH going higher up by 4.3% but that also lifting the rest of the sector and it was the numbers that came through in particular in China the strength there in China, a bit of weakness in the United States, that's not a focus for investors it seems at the moment. The China turnaround and the reopening story continues to pay dividends for this business and for the sector We're also focused on what's going on on the house builders in the UK. HSBC upgrading their uh, guidance on seven companies within this sector. I picked Bell way as just one example of that uh, but the stock up by 3.7 percent HSBC saying yes there's some downside story here but a lot of that is in their view reflected in the price and NL this is the negativity around energy names we've seen management changes at some big Italian companies as a result of a reshuffle uh, introduced by the Italian government NL uh, changes its leadership and that means that the CEO who's been there for nine years is not going to be there much longer and so some uncertainty about strategic direction there Matt. I I'm surprised you didn't show me Tesco today <laughs> you know I love a good grocery story. And but, every little helps. Yeah. I always love to say Not the tag. Not day for it. Uh, Tesco on the way up have, uh, amid efforts, I should say, on uh, prices to keep profits steady. We'll continue to watch the UK grocers, of course. Now, policymakers at the Fed are betting they need to do a little more to curb inflation. Minutes of last month's meeting indicate the central bank is on track to extend its run of interest rate hikes next month. Meanwhile, San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly outlined two separate scenarios. Looking ahead, 
there are good reasons to think that policy may have to tighten more to bring inflation down. But there are also good reasons to think that the economy may continue to slow, even without additional policy adjustments. Valerie Titel, Bloomberg Markets reporter, joins us now for more. And um, Valerie, how do we balance the key takeaways from the Fed minutes with what we've been hearing from Fed governors? Look, Matt, the key takeaway from those minutes is that the window for a soft landing is closing. As you mentioned previously, the mild recession that they're now predicting in late 2023 was noted in the minutes. And the fact that many, uh, many at the FOMC lowered their peak rate due specifically to those banking strains. That was what we saw in the dot plot. And then lastly, several stressed policy flexibility. That's the same kind of line we heard from Mary Daly in that uh, video we just played. And the same kind of dovish comment we heard from Goolsby two days ago talking about patience and prudence when it comes to rate hikes, uh, weighing those rate hikes versus the banking stress and the, the possible credit contraction we could see uh, as a uh, outcome. OK, so that's the Fed story. We got that, of course, after hours for European participants uh, in global markets just yesterday. Valerie, we've had a little longer to digest the CPI number. Has the markets thinking on what we heard moved on at all? Look, the market's knee-jerk reaction was that it was a soft number, many pointing to the fact that services inflation and that super core component, that's the core services X housing, uh, finally uh, showed a bit of reprieve. Uh, there was some bad messages in, in, that, in that print as well that goods inflation uh, uh, did rise. The one exciting thing for me in this inflation print was the fact that uh, rental inflation is falling. And this is important because the run-up in rental inflations that we saw uh, after COVID was quite phenomenal. We know it's sticky. We know it lags. But now it's finally peaked. The question now is just how quickly will it fall? Now, Powell has dismissed this component as it being lagged and it doesn't matter. But if it does fall out of the index quite quickly, it will have a big impact on the core CPI. Now, uh, the market's reaction it, uh, it was kind of, a, the knee-jerk reaction was that it was soft, yes. But then a bit of a reevaluation that while it was soft, it's not going to do much to change uh, uh, the, the Fed when it comes to hiking in the next May meeting. We are still pricing in a probability of a May, of a May hike and then a pause in the meeting after. We actually saw Goldman actually re, uh, uh, mm. changing their forecast. They were um, originally uh, pricing in a hike in June. They've now pulled back on that and the reason why Matt they cited those uh, the lending surveys that we got earlier this week showing that credit conditions are tightening. Okay, Valerie, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Valerie Titel on the Fed and CPI. Let's get to data out of China. Exports unexpectedly rose from China in the month of March, the first gain in some six months, in a further positive sign for the economy. Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie joins us now with analysis. Tom, uh, good morning to you. So what drove this mm. surprise jump in exports? And I suppose, crucially, will it be sustained? There seem to be domestic and international factors. Yeah, those are the key questions, of course, in terms of whether this is sustained. It was a big <laughs> jump and it was a big surprise. 15% increase in and exports by and for the month of March compared to estimates of a contraction of 7%. Now, in terms of what was behind this, part of it was a bit of a catch-up. January and February had a lot of factories closed because of COVID, rattling and rippling through the population and the workforce. So some catch-up there as well, but also some strong demand that's being plagued by Chinese officials coming through from Southeast Asia, but also Europe as well. When you break it down, you see things like oil products, steel products, and this is one for Matt Miller, cars as well. There's about 80% hmm. jump in terms of Chinese exports of cars just in the first quarter. On the question of whether we can be sustained, that, of course, is, is central. This is a really important pillar, of course, exports for the Chinese economy. There's a view from many, including our own team of Bloomberg Economics, that if you take into effect and to account the catch-up, but also that stagnation that's expected from economies like the US, that maybe this won't hold up. I think cars is one thing that they're going to definitely be exporting much, much more of in the future because as the quality of the Chinese product rises, mm -hmm. um, the price is so competitive that Europeans and maybe Northern Americans are going to be um, buying them uh, exponentially more. One thing that may not increase in terms of experts, to, exports, Tom, is uh, iPhones, right? Because Apple is exploring ways to reduce its reliance on China. Bloomberg has learned that more than $7 billion of iPhones were assembled in India in the last fiscal year. That triples production as they kind of move, as they shift their production from China to India. What's, it, what's that story look like to you? 
Well, it's, it's really significant, Matt, as you say, and what it is an indication of is that Apple's strategy to diversify its production is starting to work. $7 billion, as you say, tripling, tripling the amount of production, and that's in the most recent fiscal year. So 7% of their iPhone production, 7% now coming from India. That's up from 1% in 2021. What they've done, Apple, is they've leaned on some of their major producers and suppliers like Foxconn to build out facilities in India. They've also, by the way, leaned on Indian government officials to offer them subsidies and incentives. And that seems to be working. And as you say, this is about diversifying away from China. They had all those issues, of course, around their factory in Zhengzhou during the pandemic and what that meant in terms of the delay of getting the product to market. But have also, of course, the geopolitics. And that looks like it's only getting worse. The long-term picture is, or at least the medium term, is that by 2025, you could be seeing about 25% of Apple's production coming out of India. Again, if things continue on course. For this year, at the end of 2023, they're hoping to be producing the latest itineration of the iPhone, both in India and China, at the same time. It's the first time they will have ever done that, produce the latest iPhone in two countries at the same time. Tom, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie with the latest on China and those shifts toward India in terms of iPhone production. Now, uh, back to Europe and the UK Chancellor Jeremy Hunt says the UK's economy will do significantly better than the IMF's bleak outlook. Hunt discussed the state of the economy yesterday with Maria Tadeo in Washington. I think there's a lot of confidence in the UK. Uh, the IMF themselves say that the UK is on the right track. Uh, we've had two big fiscal events, uh, a budget and an autumn statement, uh, which I think have commanded international confidence. So I think there's a lot of positivity towards the UK this time round. Meanwhile, UK GDP data coming out just hours ago showed that the economy stalled unexpectedly in February. So that's a data a little bit weaker than had been expected. Joining us now for more is Bloomberg UK economy reporter Tom Rees. Tom, take us uh, under the hood. What stood out to you in terms of the, the data suite that we got out today on the UK? So the data this morning showed that the UK economy flatlined in February. January is a little bit better than we're expecting. Um, it's largely because of strikes. Um, you know, we have large strikes um, in the health sector, teachers, civil servants in February. So you might actually see that as a bit of a positive because that will probably reverse as we start to see some of these pay deals uh, happen. We've already seen pay deals for nurses, of course, um, and parts of the rail sector. But we've still got, you know, we've still got junior doctors out on strike in the UK this week. Um, so l looking forward, maybe that's a positive, but the, the overall picture is that this is a flatline in the economy. It's a little bit more resilient than we were expecting a couple of months ago, but it's, it's not great news. Hey, there is some good news, though. UK property surveyors see sales rise for the first time in a year. So what's happening to the UK real estate market? Is it finally opening up a little bit? It's, it's really interesting. It's, uh, the UK housing market has proven a lot more resilient than we were expecting. You know, interest rates have risen quite a bit in the UK as they have else, elsewhere. And we've seen mortgage rates go up, but we're still seeing some signs of resilience. Um, I mean, a lot of the uh, indicators that um, this survey uh, you're talking about shows, uh, looking at price, you know, new sellers, new buyers, are all kind of negative, but they're starting to, those indicators are starting to improve a little bit. And we are seeing, um, I say, now expect sales to be rising in a year's time as, you know, interest rates maybe start to come down towards the uh, end of the year. I mean, mortgage rates have already started to come off their highs um, from last October when they massively spiked in the wake of Liz Truss's disastrous uh, mini budget. All right. Uh, I guess that's uh, good news for everyone. Tom, thanks so much. Bloomberg's Tom Reese there talking to us about the closely watched UK housing market. Let's take a look at some of the stocks we're walk watching in uh, pre-market trading in the US today. First off, Ferrari listed at the New York Stock Exchange up in the pre-market after it signed a memorandum of understanding with Samsung Display to develop an advanced display solution, probably a curved OLED uh, panel for Ferrari's next generation model. So uh, watch this space. Also in cars, Stellantis is up as one of its battery suppliers, China's S-Volt Energy Technology Company, said it's going to add as many as five factories in Europe. Stellantis is gaining a quarter of a percent, uh, one and a quarter percent. S-Volt was actually spun 
run out of BMW partner Great Wall Motor Company, speaking of Chinese car makers, and already has two locations in Germany, with one of them um, planning to start supplying Stellantis, the maker of the Dodge Challenger Hellcat, um, by 2025. Of course, the Hellcat will be dead by then. Uh, also, Harley Davidson is moving down after the MoCo said finance chief Gina Gutter is stepping down. She joined Harley Davidson in 2020. Treasurer David Viney will serve as the interim CFO effective April 28th. But we can see Harley Davidson hog shares now down 3.8% in the pre-market. Anna? Okay, coming up on the program, we'll get back to macro themes. Klaus Bader joins us, a global chief economist at Societe Generale. Matt Miller is not over the minutes, so we will certainly dwell on those a little. And the CPI data of yesterday, what did we learn from that? And on commodities, we'll talk to Annika Gupta, a director of research at Wisdom Tree. Uh, we've seen OPEC Plus taking action on production levels over the past couple of weeks or so. How has that changed Annika's thinking about the outlook there? Plus, Mike Novogratz is predicting a credit crisis in the United States. Part of our interview with the Galaxy Digital founder, and CEO ahead. Regional banks are under stress. They need to raise capital. One way you raise capital is you stop lending. Banks are going to make less. They're going to make less loans and make less money. Uh, and that will slow the economy. Credit, credit contraction recessions are bad. And that's when I think you'll see the Fed move more aggressively mm -hmm. to, to cut rates than, than people had thought. Back to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. I'm Matt Miller here in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Now, I am still getting over the minutes. I'm still getting over the CPI release that we had yesterday. Not a lot of big fireworks, but if you dug under the hood, as Valerie Titel uh, does quite well, you can see some really interesting moves. You might have expected energy inflation to come down. And this white line here is um, the CPI energy index. Obviously, it's turned over because we had seen oil prices falling. However, recently that has changed with the surprise production cut from OPEC Plus about a week and a half ago um, and another leg up in oil prices uh, over the session yesterday. We see WTI crude oil coming up. That's this blue line. So the question is, does the rise in crude prices mean that the turn over in uh, the energy index is over. Joining us to talk about this is Noor Al Ali, Bloomberg Markets Live editor. And Noor, um, we do see the energy component maybe uh, posing a threat to disinflation, don't we? Absolutely, 100%. That's absolutely true, Matt. And I think the, the point to, to OPEC's credit is that they're quite uncomfortable when prices, when we're looking at Brent, the global benchmark, uh, falling below 80. So whenever we see that kind of price action or a distancing from what they say uh, from the macro fundamentals and the supply tightness in the market, that's when they say, OK, we're going to cut supplies again. But in reality, there is concern also about demand. We have seen economic data out of China today point to the fact that perhaps factory production and fa the factory sector hasn't really been contributing to the rebound. It's mostly been consumer spending. And we've really been relying on Chinese demand really picking up for, you know, to, to gobble up all those uh, cr crude bottles. But right now what we see, though, with energy prices going up, with oil prices going up, there are fears about supply constraints. And, you know, we all know the inflation story. It was energy-led back at in 2020 mm. and 2021, and that potentially could okay. lead to a resurgence of that uh, headline inflation coming up. Just as we thought those uh, comparables were going to get easier year on year, Nor. Um, what about other metals? I know you focused on copper. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I, I think with copper, it's also tied to the Fed here, the dollar. I mean, obviously, that situation is quite, you know, hinges on whether or not dollar strength or dollar you know, weakening is going to be the theme coming into the next uh, half of the year. We are expecting, you know, or the market, let's say, is expecting the Fed to cut rates. Obviously, the Fed hasn't said that yet. 
So there are a little bit of uh, discrepancies here between, or divergence between what the market expects the Fed to do and what the Fed says it's going to do. And in that kind of divergence, you see copper industrial metals caught up. So it's, it really does depend ultimately on whether or not copper will rely on macro fundamentals. We are seeing, of course, you know, some positivity in the economic mm. data out of China, but still okay. there's a lot of concern. No, thank you very much. And of course, I meant other commodities, not other metals. No, Al Ali of Bloomberg Markets Live. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, more market analysis on the Markets Live blog. MLIV Go is the function to use on your Bloomberg terminal. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. The Fed appears on track toward another interest rate hike next month. Policymakers are shrugging off their own staff's warning of a recession. A sign that global growth may be better than expected. Exports from China unexpectedly rose last month. And the British economy took a bigger hit than expected from all those public sector strikes last month. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. And Matt, futures point to a slightly firmer open for US stocks today. That after some uh, modest losses though, certainly on the Nasdaq yesterday. Yeah, I mean, uh, we continue to see futures rise higher and higher as the dollar falls lower and lower. So take a look at um, S&P futures right now up a quarter percent, maybe driven by hopes. Um, there are more and more Fed speakers saying, if we're not near the top of the rate cycle, we might even be past it, um, rate raising cycle. So maybe that's what's uh, driving the optimism on risk assets. You do see the 10-year yield rising, but um, less than it had been earlier and less than it was 24 hours ago. So 341.86 is the level right now on the 10-year, uh, not terribly high relative to where we've been. And then the dollar index, as I mentioned, now down below 1220. Um, it is trading weaker against most of its major uh, peers. So against the pound, for example, and against the euro, as the dollar falls, that offers uh, a little bit of a tailwind to risk assets like stocks. Crude, on the other hand, continues to rise. Right now, it's only up a nickel, but it had a, a a bang up day yesterday, up about two or three percent for both WTI and Brent. So 83.30 is what we're looking at for NYMEX crude and Brent, I think more than an 87, maybe even an 88 handle by now. Take a look at some of, speaking of gasoline, the pre-market movers. Ferrari is up after signing a memorandum of understanding, an MOU with Samsung Display. They're going to make uh, advanced displays possibly a curved OLED for Ferrari's next generation models. Those will be, you know, electric or at least hybrid vehicles, but the hybrids still tend to um, destroy gasoline because they have a, a V12 engine, thankfully. Stellantis is up one and a quarter percent after one of its battery suppliers, S-Volt Energy, said it's going to open as many as five factories in Europe. It's already got two in Germany that are poised to start uh, supplying Stellantis with batteries in 2025, right in time for the Charger Daytona to come on to the market. And um, we do see Harley Davidson falling after the CFO said she's going to leave. Gina Gutter is stepping down. She's joined Harley Davidson in, in 2020. So a short tenure there. Treasury uh, Treasurer, I should say, David Viney will serve as interim CFO at the MoCo and uh, starting April 28th. Then we'll see um, who they pick longer term. In terms of the European markets, Anna, have they turned higher as U.S. futures rise? <laughs> they might very well have done. Well, they're, they're certainly not much lower than they were half an hour ago. Stocks Europe 600 up around a quarter of 1%. But ongoing focus on consumer products, the luxury sector still in focus, Matt, here in Europe. It is the big st uh, stock story of the day, really. And that's around LVMH, the luxury goods company based in Paris, of course, but doing better than expected over in China as many consumers get back to shopping for luxury goods. There was some weakness in their story when it came from the United States, but that wasn't the focus for investors. The fo investors focused very much on the strength of the China narrative. Bellway is one of the UK house builders that has been upgraded by HSBC today. They upgraded seven companies in the sector. They see negatives around the sector, but they say a lot of those are priced. And so as a result, that stock and that sector performing pretty well. And NL down by 3.4%. So it's a story of utilities not doing great today. This is to do with the changes that we're seeing in the management instigated by the Italian government. Uh, the CEO of nine years is out and he's going to be replaced, leading to strategic uncertainty, I suppose, in the minds of a number of analysts. 
so the stock trading low, uh, lower. But, Matt, really it is a focus on luxury goods today that dominates here in Europe, which means that Paris outperforms and the consumer product sector outperforms today. And maybe another reason that we're seeing Ferrari gain in the pre-market. Joining us now is Klaus Botter, Global Chief Economist at Societe Generale. Klaus, uh, great to have you on the program. I got to get first your take on inflation. We're talking about luxury goods. Ferrari, for example, just said they're going to raise prices four or five percent. Of course, if you can afford a Ferrari now, you can afford a Ferrari with a four or five percent increase as well. What's your view more broadly on inflation as we're starting to hear more and more people complain that it's sticky at these levels? Oh, I think it's extraordinarily sticky. You see, <clears throat> one thing is clear. Headline inflation is going to plummet. Um, and that's really driven by lower energy prices, even though we've seen a little lift here in, uh, in oil prices. Um, and it's, of course, driven by food prices, which have yet to feed through. But you see, um, lower headline inflation, because those... Those high rates of inflation really represented for most economies an adverse terms of trade shock. And an adverse terms of trade shock undermines domestic purchasing power. And that's the case for most economies unless you're a major energy exporter. So as those rates come down, actually consumers benefit. And that's, if anything, going to add demand pressure on core inflation. I think core inflation is going to be very sticky. Mm. And there's another argument, too, for it, and that's that labor markets remain incredibly tight. And um, higher, and those past price increases are actually still feeding through into higher wages. So I think it's going to be really tough to reduce core inflation. Yeah, good morning to you, Klaus. So, so, so you think that core inflation is sticky, part of that to do with the labour costs within the services sector, I suppose. So where does that lead the Fed? Where does that lead the Fed in deciding whether it does one more hike and in terms of how quickly it can get to supporting a slowing US economy? Well, I think they're quite a long, long ways away. Yes, they're probably going to raise another 25 basis points. I think that very much depends how the, the banking tensions in the U.S. pan out and how, much, um, how important the tightening of credit standards is going to turn out to be. Where we s seriously disagree with the current market pricing is that the Fed is going to jump into easing monetary policy. Um, we don't think that that's on the agenda even in 20, until 2024. And in fact, you know, recently I've had this slight concern. You know, everybody expects the interest rates to go up in the UK, in the US, a little bit more, a bit more in the euro area because the ECB is so far behind. And then they're going to quickly t uh, cut interest rates. I don't think that that's a foregone conclusion. What I worry about more and more is that central banks lean back, wait, whatever, six months, nine months, waiting for core inflation to decline, then it doesn't. And then we could see another tightening cycle. If that happens, there isn't going to be a dry eye in the bond market. OK, so <laughs> it might not just be hiking and then pausing and cutting. It might be hike, pause, and then hike again. That's be... I think it's absolutely possible. Right, OK. And what do we, how do we feed in the, the China growth story to that narrative? Because we saw overnight that Chinese exports did much better than expected. And a lot of that is about the global economy. It's about recovery in Europe, for example. Well, it's a lot to do with China itself. I mean, I think that actually... In in, not so much in Asia, of course, but uh, in Europe and the U.S., the fact that China really was in a recession in 2022, and not and a pretty harsh one, not by two negative quarters, but that's, for China, a totally inappropriate measure. You know, the fact is that China is back. Now, Xi Jinping decided within a week that uh, COVID went from an extremely dangerous disease to just a little flu. And uh, the opening up of the Chinese economy has been much faster than we expected, and the, the activity data are bouncing back very strongly. More actually for the services sector, which the domestic economy benefits more from initially. But yeah, China is back, and that's, I think, a huge factor that should really support sentiment in the global economy. So far, it hasn't really done so. We saw, uh, we had an interview yesterday with Jeremy Hunt at the IMF spring meetings um, down here in Washington, D.C. He signaled that an election may be held as early as spring of next year, um, at which point he expects the economy to have turned the corner, which I think is really interesting considering the data that we got out overnight, Klaus. Uh, what's your take on the U.K. economy right now? Well, you know, the UK economy has been another one of those big surprises. You know, we were always pushing back against the 2022 recession, in, sorry, 23 recession in the US, and we never had a euro area recession in our forecast. But the UK seemed to be like a shoe-in, um, because the UK really is by the, the adverse factors that are impacting 
primarily advanced economies are hitting the UK economy particularly harshly. And yet the UK economy too has uh, surprised with uh, resilience. Whether it really can recover as quickly as Jeremy Hunt expects, you know, that's in the stars. Um, but uh, it is true that the UK economy too has performed much better than expected and this uh, whatever five, six quarter recession that the Bank of England expected is simply not materializing. You, you mentioned the food prices, uh, food price inflation hasn't yet um, come through. I noted uh, with Anna earlier that Tesco is uh, trying to hold prices firm here, uh, I guess, for, for consumers. How much of a threat is that to the UK as opposed to in the US and Europe? God, it's hard to say. Um, it just seems inflation really is much harsher there than it, on, on, on the island um, than it is on the continent. That may well be. Um, I'm not 100% sure about that. I mean, the UK, UK, of course, has shot himself in the foot in a big way with, uh, with the Brexit. That's still my opinion. Um, what I do note is that energy price inflation in the UK has been much, much more sticky than in the euro area or in the US or even in Japan. Um, so that's just amongst the pressures. The other big pressure that I see in the UK economy is that fiscal policy is, is tight and tightening and uh, tighter than either in the euro area or in the US. And let's not forget, um, the Bank of England has raised interest rates reasonably aggressively, more so than the ECB in the UK, is a, is a housing market or has a housing market which is very sensitive to short-term interest rates, even if, you know, most mortgages nowadays are fixed, but they're fixed at two years. I wouldn't even call that a fixed rate. I would call that a, you know, a slowly adjusting interest rates, right? or like, you know, one of those ARMs that was so infamous in the US some years ago. Okay, fixed for now, maybe. Uh, Klaus, exactly. Thanks very much. Klaus Bader of Societe Generale, thanks for bringing us your thoughts on the global economy. Coming up, we will discuss the commodities outlook with Annika Gupta, a Director of Research at Wisdom Tree. She joins us next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, an interview with the Eurogroup president, Pascal Donahoe. That's at 10 a.m. New York time. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. Let's focus now on commodities as oil holds near a five-month high. Joining us now is Annika Gupta, a director of research at Wisdom Tree. Annika, good to speak to you. Let's focus firstly on commodities and broaden the conversation later. Uh, we've seen oil prices then rally back up from March, uh, from the March dip, the March lows, if you like. Brent now at 87.10. Uh, what do you see as the trajectory for oil prices from here? Because, of course, you've got strength in the Chinese data most recently. Ongoing concerns, though, about a slowdown in the U.S. Uh, and the, the supply story develops with OPEC+. Plus. I wonder how you see all that coming together. Very good morning, Anna. Yes, you're right. Uh, you know, we've had a strong uh, rebound in oil prices since the OPEC cuts, uh, voluntary cuts were announced. Um, I think, uh, you know, OPEC has was setting the stage for these cuts in a very uh, clear way. Um, and that's evident from the fact that their demand forecasts were consistently lower than other forecasters in the market. Uh, the way we're looking at the supply demand balance is for Q2 of 2023, we expect the market to be in equilibrium, but by Q3 and Q4, that's when we, we will start to see the oil market move into a uh, supply deficit, and it's likely to, uh, you know, help prices uh, trend higher. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, where we see prices actually heading, I think uh, cuts, these supply cuts alone cannot drive prices higher. We will need to see that demand uh, stronger demand coming in. Uh, so as you alluded to the fact that we have, uh, you know, the oncoming recession in the US, uh, if it's, um, you know, a little softer than expected, then we're likely to continue to see that demand uh, holding up from China, and that should keep prices supported. Uh, so we expect a price gap um, of uh, around $90 a barrel, um, as yes, the cuts do support prices higher, but they itself alone cannot, um, you know, help uh, prices uh, go higher than that point. Uh, the key focus will be on demand, and that too stemming from China. Annika, is the is the problem with demand, um, you know, an economic problem? Prices are high, people are tightening their belts. Um, 
because I'm wondering how much EVs play into this. Is it at all a factor that people are adopting at a greater rate electric vehicles and using less gasoline, going to the gas station less often? Hi, Matt. Yes, uh, you know, EVs for us, so the energy transition is going to be a structurally important uh, factor that is going to bolster commodities in the long run and could be that important turning point for commodities being at their next super cycle. Um, so we are seeing greater uptake from uh, investors uh, in, in um, you know, moving from uh, an in internal combustion engine to now an electric vehicle engine. And, uh, you know, take, for example, China, which is giving out subsidies to Chinese consumers to buy more EVs. China is uh, you know, wanting to be a leader in this space. And it's clearly going to dr drive a lot of demand for industrial metals that are integral to uh, the energy transition and the build out of the energy transition. And yeah. uh, because governments have their have their stake in it, uh, you know, consumers are going to likely follow. In, in terms of the Chinese demand picture, I note that we've only seen, you know, copper's had a rally, but it's only up 7.5% year to date. Um, iron ore is up 10. Uh, you know, are we seeing these prices boosted from the Chinese, Chinese reopen, or um, does this look benign to you, the gains that we've seen? So for now, I think within the industrial metal space, sentiment is weighing on the industrial metals uh, market. And the reason for that is there are concerns of a recession, and that is dominating uh, sentiment, which is why we have seen uh, a lesser than expected uh, upside to prices. But if you really look at it, inventory levels, so current inventory levels for be it copper, aluminum, zinc, uh, nickel, they are actually trading at uh, more than a 30% discount to their five-year average. So while sentiment remains weak, uh, over the longer term, given the incremental demand you will need for the energy transition, uh, and given the fact that inventory levels already are so low, we expect prices in the long run to head higher. Mm, and interesting, we've seen M&A in the sector in, in the run-up to some of those structural changes you described. And you kept thinking about China and Chinese demand, which is where we started this conversation, uh, around commodities, I'm drawn to the LVMH story today. Luxury goods once again delivering better than expected results. And this stock up more than 20%. Uh, the rest of the sector doing really well. That's a year-to-date figure, of course. Uh, how much further do you think we have to run on that kind of, that kind of narrative? Um, the thing is, Anna, you know, you can't lock up the Chinese consumer for three years and then expect them not to spend. So clearly, even if you look at the PMI numbers, you're getting this clear diversification, bifurcation between manufacturing and services. So the services industry continues to be bolstered higher, and that is because Chinese consumers are spending. Um, and what is their most favorite choice uh, of, of uh, you know, uh, high-end uh, revenue expenditure that comes back to Europe. Uh, Europe derives more than 8% of revenue from China. So it, uh, in terms of revenue, from a revenue point of view, it's the second highest after Asia Pacific. And hence it stands to benefit uh, when that China reopening, you know, uh, takes place in a more meaningful way. And that's what we're really seeing playing out in the numbers. Anika, thank you very much. Anika uh, Gupta of Wisdom Tree, thanks for bringing us your thoughts. Coming up, Mike Novogratz sees optimism in the crypto community. Part of our interview with the Galaxy Digital founder and CEO next. This is Bloomberg.